Good afternoon. I'm Katie Pryor, Chief Development Officer and Senior Vice President of Member Engagement for the Greater Houston Partnership. Thank you for joining us for today's annual meeting and for staying tuned for our live fireside chat with Amy Cronus and Bob Harvey. We had around 2,000 people tune in for the main event, and we know many of you have stuck around. In this afternoon's live discussion, Amy and Bob will dive deeper into the partnership strategic initiatives for 2021 and Houston's unique opportunities to further its position as a great global city. On behalf of the partnership staff, board of directors, and 1,000 member companies, we are honored to have each of you as a part of the virtual discussion that you'll participate in today. The partnership's impact is possible because of you, our member companies, and we thank you for your investments and your engagement in our work. If you're not a member and joining us for the first time, we welcome you to the conversation and can't wait to get you involved. Later in today's discussion, Amy and Bob will take live questions from our virtual audience. If you have questions about anything you heard at annual meeting or the topics they discuss throughout the fireside chat, we encourage you to participate in today's chat by submitting your questions via text using the information on the screen. Now, let's continue the conversation by welcoming back President and CEO of the partnership, Bob Harvey, and 2021 Partnership Chair and Deloitte Houston Managing Partner, Amy Cronus. Well, th thank you, Katie. And Amy, thank you for being here today and for serving as chair in the upcoming year. I'm really looking forward to our discussion and working together. Before we get started, I should note we are observing COVID-19 safety protocols to produce this live event. We are appropriately distanced and Amy and I have a plexiglass divider between us. You know, at our traditional annual meeting, we come together in a large ballroom. We give our speeches, and then the event's over. This virtual setting gives us a great opportunity for some follow-up discussion to unpack our key themes a bit more and to engage you, our members, in the conversation. So speaking of key themes, during our annual meeting, you heard details of our Houston Next strategic plan. While we paused our Houston Next capital campaign during the first several months of the pandemic, the implementation of the capital plan never stopped. I'm pleased to share we have restarted our fundraising efforts and we've had three new investors in the start of this new year. So we're currently at $27.4 million against our goal of $50 million over seven years. So thank you to all of our Houston Next investors, current and future for investing with the partnership. Now, as Katie mentioned at the beginning, we do encourage all of our viewers to send in your questions around the issues outlined during the annual meeting. So please text your questions to the numbers on your screen. So with that, let's get started. Now, Amy, you know, in your speech today, you called out Houston's opportunity to embrace what I believe you called the innovation transformation that is driving the reordering of the world's global economies. Tell us why you focused on digital transformation as your key priority as chair of the partnership. Sure, thanks, Bob. You know, as I outlined in my speech, Houston-based organizations have made significant investments over the last 10 to 15 years to become digitally mature. But I know we can do so much more, and it's important that we do so. In this next phase of digital transformation, much of this work will be focused on innovation in B2B companies, so which has traditionally been an area of strength for Houston, and I believe gives us an opportunity to lead. Uh, our Deloitte research, research has found that digitally mature companies enjoy benefits that include, but also go well beyond the bottom line. Uh, the benefits include reduced environmental impact and increased workforce diversity, which are increasingly seen as just bottom line bo companies' basic broader social responsibility. So we have a unique opportunity to work together as a community to ensure Houston reaches this next level of digital transformation. Well, Amy, in your speech, you also noted the great wins that Houston has had over the last several years. And you suggested that businesses and citizens need to act as catalysts and champions, I believe were your words, for change in the greater Houston community. So could you describe for our viewers, how can Houstonians help spread the word about all that Houston has going for it? And how can they engage in not only the partnerships work, but the activities around the community as a whole? Absolutely. You can tell this is a favorite topic of mine. Uh, let me begin by reiterating that Houston's a great global city. We're incredibly fortunate to live in such a diverse, vibrant city with a strong economy. And we just keep getting better. I truly think we have a quality of life here that is not as well known as it should be, and tr but it's really truly transformed over the last decade. 
the arts, the culinary scene, our parks and green spaces, lots of sporting activities. We have so much right at our fingertips and we enjoy all of it at a much lower cost of other, than other major cities. So again, as I said in my speech, when you have the opportunity, we have to spread this message. Repetition matters and you can be part of this. I wanna encourage everyone to be an advocate, uh, an ambassador. So when you're talking to your friends and family in other places, um, when you're collaborating with colleagues and associates elsewhere around the world, please use these opportunities to discuss what makes Houston special. You know, I'm one of the biggest advocates for telling the Houston story. So as a key part of the story, Bob, we, we, you know, we wanna share Houston's incredible diversity. We often speak with pride of Houston being America's most diverse city. You and I both mentioned it in our speeches today. But this summer, Houston and the entire country were confronted with the murder of George Floyd and experienced the ensuing national reckoning with racial injustice. And this reckoning was new for some, but for many, it was a reality all too familiar. Can, can you talk about the partnership's response to the events of the summer and our approach to addressing these issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion? Well, you know, George Floyd's death was such a, such a tragedy, such a shock. We knew we needed to act. But we were encouraged first before acting to listen. And as you recall, Amy, we spent a lot of time over the summer meeting with members of the community from a diverse cross-section of groups, from community activists and community groups to, to entrepreneurs uh, from the minority community and talked about the challenges they faced. We talked to our own staff, probably something we should have done before, but we heard a lot from our staff. And you'll recall, we spent the June and August board meetings largely to focused on this subject. Uh, we then formed the Racial Equity Committee of our board, uh, chaired by Dr. Ruth Simmons, a president of Prairie View A&M University, and Gretchen Watkins, the president of Shell Oil. Uh, th this is a board level committee. We only have two other committees that operate this way, s simply made up of board members. Uh, we then retained someone we had never had before, a head of diversity, equity, and inclusion for the partnership. We hired Latanya Flix, and she's gonna lead our efforts both with within the partnership, but also our programmatic efforts out in the community. The Racial Equity Committee set out to develop a set of principles, we call them our racial equity principles, that would really be the framework for the Houston business community to, to describe its commitment. You know, we talked about, we used a phrase, I used it in my speech, reforming systems of bias, strengthening underserved communities, advocating inclusion, removing barriers to achievement. Well, we've developed a set of principles now that speak to how we're gonna do that. And we've had over 100 of our, almost 100 of our board member companies that have signed on to those principles and we'll be soon, soon to be asking other companies in Houston to sign on. We have a long way to go. We're just really moving into the programmatic phase, but I'm very pleased, frankly, with the commitment that the partnership has shown and the progress we've already made. You know, Amy, you know, to continue on this topic, uh, I'd like to hear your perspective, frankly, about this phrase, you know, you, again, I think you used it in your remarks, Houston's opportunity to become America's most inclusive and open city and one that op offers opportunity for all. What, what, is, what does that statement mean to right. you? Right. Well, it was true for me 35 years ago and it's still true today. Uh, DE&I is absolutely important in innovation and digital tech, strengthening the economy. Now we hear from companies that are looking at Houston to relocate or expand their operations and their leaders want to know how we are creating real opportunity for people. It's not enough for them to hear that Houston's a diverse place. They rightly want to know how inclusive it is. And as a business community, we're working to ensure that everyone feels that they can belong and, and succeed here. And um, so I, I'll mention uh, you know, our several goals around that. We're reforming systems of bias, we're strengthening underserved communities, we're advocating inclusion, and we're removing barriers to achievement. Together, we have to continue to work to advance racial equity within our organizations and communities. So Amy, I'd like to now shift to a completely different topic, and that was one, again, we talked about a bit on the, on the event a few minutes ago. That's the global energy transition. You know, as we know, Bobby Tudor really led the partnership in this direction, uh, beginning with his annual meeting speech a year yep. ago. Uh, he's continued to, to lead the effort. We refer to it as, you know, how do we help create a more efficient and sustainable low carbon future while accommodating global demand growth. We call that the dual challenge, you'll yeah. recall. And that dual challenge still exists, by the way. Uh, and I'm really pleased that Bobby has agreed to continue to chair our energy transition effort. But with your background as, you know, with Deloitte's energy resources and industrials practice, and your work with the sustainability committee in the prior couple of years, 
Could you tell us about your outlook on the global energy transition and our unique opportunity to continue to position Houston as a leader in this space? Sure, another favorite topic for me. So to set the context, energy transition is about the transition from hydrocarbon dependence across the economy toward greater reliance on cleaner energy sources. And it's only going to accelerate. As many are already aware, the Biden administration is elevating a lower carbon future agenda through policy changes and large scale investments, including, uh, I'll mention uh, some uh, again, re rejoining the Paris Climate Agreement, uh, investing $2 trillion over four years in infrastructure clean energy, achieving econ uh, economy wide net zero emissions by 2050, and a carbon free power sector by 2035. Uh, they've announced intention to incorporate climate considerations throughout policymaking in the executive branch. They're requiring disclosure of climate risks and financial statements of public companies and pursuing environmental justice by enhancing investments and creating jobs in marginalized communities. So as we all know, Houston's a market that has thrived on being leaders in the exploration and processing of hydrocarbon. Yet we're also very much a city of intellectual and research horsepower in the energy industry. So we have the opportunity in Houston to move along the energy tra transition path by six channels that I'll, that I'll quickly mention. Um, one, contributing to the knowledge to create new technologies and advancements in renewables and carbon capture. Secondly, mapping out the pathway to carbon decarbonization and how Houston can capitalize on our unique geographic position. Thirdly, paying close attention to the consumer wants and needs as well as the stakeholder pool that will contribute to the energy transition acceleration. Fourth, keeping a close pulse on new policy that would drive change. Using, fifth, using energy efficiency as a driver for a lower carbon future. Lastly, supporting new investments in alternative fuels and renewables. In fact, Texas and Houston have already made some great progress with renewables. And Houston ranks number one, people don't realize this, in America in renewable energy use. So I thought I'd offer just a, just a few other fun facts around that, that Texas is the U.S. state leader of wind energy, generating enough wind to power over six million homes. Texas is the second state in the U.S. with the most solar capacity installed. The city of Houston sources 92% of its power from wind and solar energy. Our, our mayor has cited this often, and it just keeps getting better. And hydrogen production will require abundant, very cheap renewable energy sources. So, you know, I think we're well poised here. Um, you know, another interesting fact, Deloitte's done a lot of research around the impact of the energy transition with oil, gas, and chemical companies. And we're currently working on a very interesting project with the American Chemistry Council a joint project based on, focused on a pathway for a lower carbon future for the chemical industry. So with that, I would just want to say we're, there's so much going on that's exciting. And um, Bob, so I would want to turn it, Bob, to uh, public policy around this. We know in addition to the partnerships, economic and workforce development work, the organization also works in the public policy to advocate on all levels of government on issues that strengthen our business climate. So specifically on energy transition, it's been named a priority for the partnership, both in its federal and state legislative agendas this year. Could you comment on the public policy work at the local, state, and federal levels? Yeah, I'll, I'll, you know, I mentioned in my remarks that this legislative session, it'll be brief, it'll be difficult. You know, the state is right. very fiscally constrained. I said our focus would be energy and access. And by access, I mean mainly education issues and digital access. But on the energy side, there's a whole host of issues that we need to be addressing. You know, we think about legislation that impacts permitting of energy activities, regulation of energy activities, all the energy infrastructure, both I would say for traditional oil and gas, but all this renewable infrastructure that's going to take from power to others uh, to advance. One specific opportunity you've heard a lot about is carbon capture, use, and storage, CCUS. Yep. We need legislation in Texas that really positions Texas as a leader in that respect. Houston needs it in particular because we have this opportunity to be the leader in CCUS, but state, the state has to do its part. There's a term called primacy. We need to have regulatory authority over a lot of this activity that otherwise would vest uh, with our national government. You mentioned Mayor Turner and his all that he's doing, the climate action plan, we're gonna to continue to work with the city uh, that's been a great partner. And now we anticipate working with the Biden administration. The key there is to help the Biden administration come to that same conclusion that Greentown Labs came to, if you think about it, that really this issue cannot move forward without the support of Houston. We're in a great position, frankly, to do more in the, in the 
way of climate change Absolutely. than just about anyone. So, so I'm, I'm optimistic at this point that we can make the case that with the Biden administration that there's a special role for Houston and we want to play that role. So, so I think we need to shift, Amy, to uh, okay. the, the Q&A. Right. Uh, so for the remainder of this afternoon session, we'd like to answer questions submitted by our members who've joined us virtually. So please continue to submit your questions by texting the number on your screen. Now, to moderate our live Q&A, I want to turn it back over to Katie, who's fielding the questions coming in. So, Katie, it's all yours. Thank you, Bob, and thank you, Amy, for the great discussion. As Bob mentioned, we're going to keep the conversation going with questions that we've received from those of you watching. So thank you so much for sending them in. We will do our best to get to all of the questions we can, and anything we don't get to, we will uh, follow up with you afterward. So our first question, Bob, I'm going to pose this one to you. It is coming from John Sowers, SVP at Sempra LNG. And it's a question I'm sure many of our members have on their minds. How will the partnership continue to address issues around reopening and building back Houston's economy from the impacts of COVID-19? Well, I'm glad that John's looking ahead because that's a topic we want to talk about. We want to do a lot of things about. Well, first, you know, we're helping with the vaccine administration. We're working with the medical center in the city and the county to see if we can move this vaccine administration as quickly as possible, uh, you know, and get it into the arms, as we say, of the folks who are at greatest risk. So I'm not, you know, looking beyond that a bit, uh, we've got to help people reskill and reenter the workforce. 150,000 Houstonians do not have a job today that had a job back in February. And their, their old jobs may not be there. So we have to help them reskill uh, and reenter the workforce. So we're gonna be working with community colleges, with employers who have jobs, with public schools, uh, and with all of you in the community to help, help make that happen. But, you know, there's, Amy mentioned one other thing, which is this, this whole resorting of leadership around the world. You know, we're doing a lot right now to position Houston as the city that someone should be looking at. If, if you're considering leaving the West Coast or the East Coast, well, consider Houston. If you have a company headquartered on the West Coast or the East Coast, think about whether you want to move that headquarters to Houston. That thought process has now entered the minds of so many executives, and we're doing our best to get the message to them that Houston is the place they should be. Yep. I, I would just like to add around the opportunity to rebound a lot of the employees that were displaced and look at adjacent you know, opportunities in, in adjacent industries. So, so, for example, many of the skilled energy employees have STEM backgrounds in geology, engineering, and chemistry. And because of their deep roots in the sciences, they could provide real technical expertise to for jobs needed in the aerospace and health and life sciences. No, that's so right, Amy. Yeah. This idea of traditional oil and gas workers who've been displaced really ought to look at these clean energy jobs, climate tech jobs. They're growing very rapidly, and they can leverage many of the same skill sets. Absolutely. Well, Bob and Amy, why don't I take us to our next question? Um, this one's coming from George Gonzalez, partner at Haynes and Boone. And we're gonna dive a little bit deeper into something that we've spent some time discussing. Amy, I'm gonna toss this to you first. Um, Amy, you've spent a great deal of time in Central Texas, specifically Austin. The market has experienced considerable growth in that tech se the tech sector in Austin and Central Texas. What lessons can Houston take from your Austin experience as we recruit tech companies and talent to Houston? Sure. You know, I think Austin benefits, I think we, many of us know this, they benefit from the growing highly educated workforce and their reputation as a, an attractive global city. And they have a longer foundation than we do of being a tech hub. And I think this further emphasis, emphasizes our need for better PR, frankly, within um, both for ourselves and externally. Uh, to let people know how much we've really advanced in these areas. Um, our young people should be excited, I mean really excited about the real opportunities here to both have fun and with lots of opportunities and fulfillment to really make an impact in the global world. I mean, you know, as I said in my speech, what we're doing here around the, the opportunities for them to help energy in its next transformation, to advance cures for humanity and health and life sciences, and help progress the aerospace frontier, that, that's real impact. And our future of work studies show that's what our young generations really want to do. They want to have Make a, have a purpose and, and make noble impact. And Houston, I think, is we're, we're well poised. I think you're right, Amy. You know, it's, it's, it's not hard for me to remember back when the motto in Austin was, you know, keep Austin weird, yeah. which was almost a way of saying, we, you know, 
don't come here. We like it the way it is. And Austin invested heavily in the semiconductor industry and kind of grabbed a particular niche and then took that niche and they've grown it into a strong digital tech uh, foundation. Dallas went in the direction of financial services and they've been very successful there. We frankly focus largely on energy because that entire period were relatively good periods. When we asked the, the question you were asked just then, you know, about Houston, you know, just a few years ago, we assessed how Houston was viewed as a technology center. And, and frankly, we, it wasn't we on the map. Yeah, we and weren't. in fact, we were ranked like 33rd or something in the country of major metros when it came to digital tech. Now, what we discovered is we had a lot more capability than was being recognized because the digital tech strengths of Houston weren't in digital companies. You know, you think of AWS or Google right. Cloud, they were in energy companies. And so we had to get the word out. We had that a strong base. But that engineering yeah. heritage well, it, is right. so strong here. That's right. It was kind of buried within the STEM workforce, right? We all talked STEM for so long. So we've done a lot in the last few years to make more visible what we had, but also attract AWS, Google Cloud, right. Microsoft, and others to really establish a visible presence here. You can't deny now that Houston's very much, you know, in the forefront of digital technology. Well, and on the rise with venture capital investment and all the tech hubs, yeah. it's, it's exciting. Yeah. Okay, we're gonna shift back to energy for just a minute. Uh, this next question comes from Stacy Keener at Western Governors University. Stacy is interested from, about hearing from Bob about energy companies and how they are working to reduce their carbon footprint. Yeah, you know, Stacy, that's a great question because we normally put that issue first, that when we, when we speak with energy companies, what we tell them is that the first thing they can do unequivocally is reduce their own carbon footprint. And that can come from just greater efficiency in their operations. With oil and gas companies, it's not letting that methane escape, which is highly dangerous to the atmosphere. It's reducing the flaring that's going on. And now some of that flaring, one can argue is needed, but much of it can be avoided with attention. So we're, we're calling on the energy companies, even before they venture off into renewables and carbon capture and all these exciting new frontiers, to really first establish that foundation, which is doing everything they can to reduce their own carbon footprint. There's no pushback, they get it. In some respects, that's table stakes to even be part of the discussion today. Okay, let's see what our next question here. Um, Okay, we have one from Gloria Barrera at Veneer Construction Management, Inc. And Gloria is asking if the partnership has an initiative for innovation and construction. <laughs> That's a tough one. Um, interestingly, one of the companies that we've worked with to attract to Houston is Plug and Play, which is one of the leading uh, West Coast Silicon Valley innovation hubs. They're, they're both a VC firm, they're an incubator, they're an accelerator. If you know much about technology innovation, you know about plug and play. So they identified construction, interestingly, as one of the areas they were focused on across their entire global footprint. And we helped connect them with the Houston construction industry. We, you know, we have some of the greatest names in construction here in Houston, whether it's a developer like Heinz or a uh, constructor, I have to say like Harvey Builders, no relation to mine, I'm afraid. Uh, but we have just tremendous leadership in that respect. So it's one of the ways we could tell plug and play, you know, come to Houston, we have great strength. You may not recognize it. Let us help navigate through the Houston uh, maze a bit. So there is opportunity there. That's a, that's a unique question. I don't hear that often, uh, but it's, it's a good niche opportunity for Houston. Thank you, Bob. We have quite a few questions coming in. We're gonna transition now to James Holmes. So James is the owner of PB and DJ Productions, LLC. James's question, what is the partnership doing to ensure Houston's workforce is prepared to meet the needs of changing industries and technologies? And how will we balance AI and maintaining jobs? Well, let me, let me come at it this way, and then we'll talk about the AI piece, which is a, an interesting twist on it. Uh, you know, we've recognized the need to really enhance the Houston workforce for some time. Uh, why are we so active in public schools? Partly is for the sake of the children and the families, partly because, frankly, as a community, we need a talent workforce, and we need that from our own public education system, not from elsewhere. But moving one step beyond that, we formed Upskill Houston now six and a half years ago, targeted at the middle skill space, right? This, this 
very important segment of the Houston economy, about 40% of jobs that don't require a baccalaureate degree, but do require skills and training and credentials beyond high school. And we've worked across sectors with construction, petrochemicals, healthcare, we're now moving into transportation. So we're doing a lot to try to create pathways to these really highly promising middle school careers, middle skill careers. But then the other thing we've just turned to recently is HUB, and, and Amy, you mentioned that in your speech, and I mentioned it in mine, Higher Education United with Business, that's the acronym, because we've also recognized that, interestingly, Houston has not been a leader in higher ed, and uh, that's a real deficiency today. People like to go to school and then go on into their careers in the cities you know, where they grew up. That's, I'd say, different than 20 or 30 years ago. So we're doing a lot to try to advance Houston institutions. And frankly, maybe I'll toss you, that's where this digital issue has come up. We're spending a lot of time talking with local universities about how we can enhance our strengths in digital education, AI, et cetera. Absolutely, and I, I think you're seeing a, a fast growth in the curriculum around data analytics and um, analytical thinking skills and critical problem solving. That, that you know, those transcend across all of needs today in, in the job arena. You know, we mentioned the Wealth Welch uh, Institute for Advanced Materials, that $100 million from the Wealth Foundation to Rice. Uh, people, when they hear advanced materials, they may not think digital, but actually new materials today are designed on a computer before they're ever, ever built in the real world. It's really a digital tech application being applied towards advanced materials. So I think we're going to see this element really surfacing in a lot, of, a lot that's happening in Houston. I often say we have to be strong in digital tech in Houston. I mean, the future is digital. It's all about AI, machine learning, all those acronyms yeah. and things we talk about. Houston has to be a leader. Fortunately, our universities get it. And you know, HPE making that tremendous contribution to and UH. And a our community years ago. colleges are coming yeah. along. Community colleges are very active in this space. So I think we get it, but you know, are we leading? I don't think we're leading yet, but we're, you know, but we're, we're getting there. Yes. Well, thank you both. Um, we're going to go to a couple of more questions. So this next question, this is for you, Amy. Okay. This comes from Paresh Patel, founder of E Squared Equitable Energy and inaugural member of Greentown Labs Houston. Yeah. And Paresh is asking, given your leadership serving on, as the chair of the Sustainability Committee, how can the partnership rally the business community in driving the sustainability and resiliency goals? To this end, can the partnership join the city in leveraging the SDGs as a framework? Well, the answer is yes, and abs absolutely. I think when we, when we started on the uh, kind of marrying our sustainability initiatives with smart city initiatives several years ago, it was very much a team effort. I mean, we included not just the city, but county and acad you know, county institutions, academics. Um, we tried to be very inclusive. Uh, you know, Bobby, I think you remember in some of the kind of the labs we did, trying to make sure we got all the constituents around the table. And there was no shortage of agreement that, he, that Houston needs to continue to make real advances. And so I think that the appetite's there. I think the city has done a lot um, with, um, you, know, th you know, with Jesse Bounds and Marissa and the other folks who have been really um, moving forward on, um, you know, data analytics, sensors, cameras, increasing our air quality monitoring. Oh, yeah, there's been a lot of advances that all move or all kind of under that smart city umbrella. Uh, there's still a lot to accomplish. I think, um, you know, as always, funding is an issue. Um, you know, the, the city and the county, you know, don't have infinite funds. So I think we need to continue, and I think the partnership is very committed to continuing to bring business leaders together to work with the county and, and city to make advances. Uh, infrastructure, as Bob mentioned, is key um, and top of the list in terms of major improvements that, that we still need to make in our region. You know, Amy, I think people were a little bit surprised when we supported yeah. the mayor's climate action plan. Yeah. I think they were surprised not because they had read the plan and didn't like it. They just assumed we would be at odds with the mayor for some reason on that. Quite the opposite. We really worked closely with them in the development of the plan. We think it's a great plan. Uh, you know, the mayor is one of the leaders around the U.S. Yeah. Uh, they call it climate mayors. I think it's like 470 mayors around the country. And I'm pleased that he's in that leadership role because I think he brings really sound judgment and perspective into those into those discussions. And I think his plan for Houston, it's innovative, it's dramatic. I mean, as you said, Houston leads the way in terms of purchasing renewable power among major metros. Who would think that Houston would be the leading metro in that respect? So the city and the, and the partnership, I think, are very much aligned on this topic. Yeah. 
but we welcome Green Town Labs helping us move forward. <laughs> That's right. That's we right. can still use help from. Yeah. And I should say that if you yeah. if you listen carefully, that you might say, well, you didn't say the county. The county is now developing their climate action plan. So I have the same optimism with the county. Right. We're just at a different place. I meant to say with Harris with County. The county. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So shifting gears just a little bit, our next question comes from Jack Belt, Executive Vice President at the Fort Bend Economic Development Council. And this question, we're going to start with you, Bob. Uh, can you tell me what flood control improvements have been made, not planned or discussed, but completed and started since Hurricane Harvey? Well, since Hurricane Harvey, that's a, Jack, that's a trick question. <laughs> <laughs> no, because it's hard to start and finish anything in that amount of time. Uh, but fortunately, uh, Sims Bayou, which was well along then, that's really pre-Harvey, but it's the great example of what we're trying to do with these other watersheds. And so if you want to see a completed project, go look at Sims Bayou. Bray's Bayou was that one, of course, that was so much in the center of the Harvey discussion. How can you not remember those images or forget those images? And now we've made great progress moving the Bray's project along. We've also advanced some flood uh, mitigation efforts that are around really just uh, trapping the water, right? It's, it's something you can do fairly efficiently is to create uh, impoundments for more water, so we see that occurring. But, you know, I'll, I'll kid Jack a little bit. It's a trick question because, frankly, this is a multi-year effort. to do this, this kind of work, it takes a long time to design, permit, and construct. Uh, you know, the $2.5 billion bond issue that the county did, you know, it's usually significant. We can match that to federal dollars. But, you know, the partnership glibly suggests that we think flood mitigation is a $30 billion problem in Houston. So we're going to be at this for a long time. Uh, it's something we shouldn't lose sight of. So it's great that Jack continues to ask uh, and we'll continue to work it. But then there are other projects that are kind of getting closer to the permitting and construction phase. Well, I have to tell us that this is going to be our last question. And if we didn't get to you today, we will follow up with you because no pun intended, we are being flooded with questions right now. Um, so this final question, this is for you, Amy. At Deloitte, how are you seeing the future of work post pandemic and how will its impact um, remote work and how we set up offices? Great question, and I don't think I hope I don't think it was planned. You have thirty minutes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can I can talk about this for a while. Well, clearly we are we are we believe we're entering into a hybrid work world. That the way we all go back to work after the pandemic won't be exactly the same, and that that's both that's good and different. I think it's still to be determined how each individual company will 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 figure this out. But there's no doubt that the pandemic has led to the positive realization that we can all accomplish a lot remotely. That technology has enabled us to reach all over the world, frankly, and get a lot of great work done uh, without the the uh, time invested in in travel and and um, planning, etc. So I think uh, most organizations are looking at a hybrid answer. To that. I think you're right. You know, you mentioned, uh, you used the phrase to be determined. I mean, the shift a few months into the pandemic, when people talked about going back to work, they were describing something that looked a lot like the old system with just a tweak or two at the margin. Now, what I hear all the time is, I don't know. I don't know what the answer is going to be. We're having those conversations right now as to what that future is going to look like. I think it's going to be a more dramatic shift than we would have imagined six months ago. You know, the, the, the employers, I mean, the employees have discovered yeah. that they, in many cases, really like working from home. Right. And the employers have learned that it can work. It, it actually can work. can work. On the other hand, I think people have also concluded it's not an 100% answer yep. because the very real learning and development needs, That's right. the networking, the learning at people's elbows, so to speak, yep. uh, is, a very, is a very real need. And the isolation does pose real wellness questions. Yeah. That's the, te what, what we just framed, that's the tension right now right. that you hear in conversation. How do we balance those, those so, competing? So I, I think uh, um, all, all large employers in particular have already really focused on the wellness issues that have, that have arisen from this. Yeah. And so, um, you know, hopefully we'll move forward in a very positive way, getting the best of both worlds. But answer honestly, I bet you've enjoyed not having to travel quite so much these last 10 months. That, true. Uh, a true silver lining is more quality time with our families. That's There's true. no doubt about that. On the other hand, all those hours I thought I got back from traveling, <laughs> I, 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 I'm, I'm Zooming and teaming all day. That's right. Yeah. yeah, that's true. We've all learned that too, yep. right? Yeah. Well, Bob and Amy, thank you for 
ending on such a thoughtful and positive note. Um, and thank you for your time today and for giving our viewers an in-depth look at key priority areas for the organization and the region. I'm gonna turn it back over to Bob for some closing remarks, Bob. Well, you know, thanks Katie. And thank you, Amy, been a lot of fun. You know, as we've heard today, Houston does face many challenges, but you've also heard that we face far greater opportunities. And I wanna thank Amy for taking on the role as the partnership chair this year and her leadership in advancing our mission to make Houston one of the world's great cities to live, work, and build a business. Uh, thanks also to all of our viewers who've joined us today virtually and have stayed with us. We appreciate you taking the time to learn even more about the partnership's work. Now, we hope you'll join us for our Partnership Week activities over the next few days where we will highlight how our members can get involved in the issues discussed during today's event. For a full lineup of events and details on these activities, please visit houston.org events. Thank all of you. Have a great afternoon. See you next year.